Hello, good evening. It's another beautiful Sunday. You're welcome to Iron Port here on Metropolitan Television. Iron Port is proudly brought to you by the Ghana Revenue Authority, Guel PLC, Serene Insurance, Ghana Link Network Services, Meridian Port Services, and Phoenix Insurance. The show is proudly powered by the Ghana Port and Harbors Authority, GPHA. And our media partner is the Business and Financial Times, the BNFT. If you want to have a grasp of all the transpired on the show tonight, make a date and grab the Thursday edition of the BNFT, and you'll be able to see all that happened here uh, on the show. Tonight, we are streaming live on our social media pages. On Facebook, we are live at Ghana Port and Harbors Authority. Ghana Port and Harbors Authority. Still on Facebook, we are live at Port of Tema. And on YouTube, we are live at Ion Port. Ion Port. Indeed, we shall be getting interactive with you. All you have to do is sit back, relax, grab your phones, and send us your messages and comments via our WhatsApp line. Today, our WhatsApp line has changed, and it is 0538-037353. 0538-037353. You can send us your messages ahead, and when the time is ripe, we shall share with the rest of the world. Uh, we shall also activate the uh, lines along the line for you to call in and contribute to the discussion here on the program. My name is Kennedy Moore. Now we are going for a quick break. When we we'll return, we'll continue with the show. Please stay with us. Guys, now I'm tired. I'll go on a date with whoever gets here first. Princess, really? Okay. Are they come? Shut Mommy, for the time I'm watching. Boss. Fill my tank with Super XP Run 95. Fill up with Super XP Run 95 and Diesel XP high performance products from Goyle. I'm on the back of the car and I'm going to go to the car. I'm going to go to the car. I'm going to go to the car. I'm going to Sorry, Tony got here first, so I'm stepping with him. Oh, cut him, cut him. Hey! Go for the car, mommy. Choose Super XP Run 95 and Diesel XP for an energizing driving experience. Always go for Goyle Super XP Run 95. Goyle, good energy. Goyle, Goyle, Goyle is good energy. Electricity, electricity, then pay your taxes. Yeah. Our taxes, our future. future. Because you see, without our taxes, we wouldn't have good roads, good schools, better hospitals, street lights, and other very important social amenities. When we pay our taxes, we give our children free and quality education. Tell that my money too small. Why should I pay my tax? Look, small. Selfful. It doesn't matter how small or big your business or income is, you still have to pay your taxes. The little taxes from each and every one of us, when put together, could give your community clean water or that deprived school with tables and chairs. Please pay your taxes. It is your responsibility. It is your civic duty. It is the law. Impressive factory. If only I had listened to you, I wouldn't have been in this mess. That devastating fire virtually wiped out the whole factory and my warehouse. Remember my misfortunes last year? Serene insurance assets all risk fire policies that I took were there to pay for my damaged stocks in the warehouse. And my machines that were affected by the floods have been replaced. My accident vehicle is back on the road. Thanks to Serene Insurance Motor Policy. Currently, my goods are on the IC covered with the American Cargo Insurance Policy. I was just telling Ajima about Serene Insurance. Oh, Ajima. Tell him more. As a road contractor, I make sure I do my contractors all risk insurance for the projects and then workers compensation for all the workers on site with serene insurance they will make sure they'll cover your unknown tomorrow today serene insurance a new face of insurance call us now MPS Terminal 3 is Africa's new state-of-the-art container terminal at Tema Port. For manufacturers, agro-processors and traders, the new port means business can be done faster. This infrastructure boost will improve Ghana's port handling capacity, connect more trading routes and oil the engine of growth for the economy, creating greater opportunities across all sectors as Africa's markets merge and become the largest trading block
globally. MPS, we connect, you thrive. Business and life can be like the sea sometimes. Sometimes serene, sometimes calm. Sometimes turbulent, and at times, it brings the unexpected. However it is like, trust Phoenix Insurance for your home, car, business, and marine insurance needs. Call 0302-246-319 or 0243-690-492. At Phoenix, you experience a delightful service delivered with wisdom. All right, so welcome back. We are now going to take a look at happenings in the port and shipping industry in the course of the week. And indeed, in the course of the week, uh, the Tema Port had calls to receive His Excellency, the President of Italy. We'll tell you what he was there to do. Plus, the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, CILT, also held a business forum on the cost of doing business. We'll bring you the details. These are more for your enjoyment. The President of Italy, Sergio Mattarella, has lauded the collaboration between the Italian Navy and the Ghana Navy in their pursuit to fight piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. He commended the efforts by the two countries as well as other countries to make the sea a conducive place for maritime business to thrive. The Italian President made this known when he visited the Italian naval ship Commandant Bettica at the port of Tema as part of his three-day working visit to Ghana. He commended the Ghana Navy for welcoming the Italian Navy vessel for a common goal of security and freedom for maritime transport and communication. This operation is extremely important to ensure peaceful coexistence, also to include and also to support the freedom of the sea through the freedom of navigation. And this also can be achieved once again through cooperation thanks to which piracy can be countered, as well as illicit trafficking. I would like also to mention the extremely important role that is played by naval diplomacy in this respect. The Minister of Defense, Dominic Nitiwo, said the three months that the Italian Navy will spend in the country will benefit the countries along the Gulf of Guinea. There's a lot we can do together. The ability to work together, and the effectiveness by which we work together. And what we are going to gain in working together would only go to strengthen the two. We in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, whether it is Zone F, which stretches from Ghana to Guinea, will greatly benefit from your visit. These three months that you are going to be with us, we do believe uh, that we will have a lot of things to share together. There was a simulation exercise to demonstrate the skillfulness and collaborative tendencies of both the Italian and Ghanaian Navy to combat piracy. Twenty twenty three recorded thirty six incidents of maritime piracy, a sharp decline from twenty twenty when one hundred and thirty two incidents were recorded. Even though the region is not out of the woods yet, it is important to note the role maritime domain awareness and training, among other factors, have played in the remarkable decline in maritime insecurities. As part of the European Union-sponsored support to the ECOWAS Integrated Maritime Strategy Project, also known as WEMS, which was launched in 2016, the Regional Maritime University has been training sea actors, naval and law enforcement officers across West Africa. The fourth and final edition of this operational training course has commenced at the university to build on the success of previous years. The specific objectives of the SWEMS project are to improve regional governance and legal frameworks, the prosecution and adjudication of maritime crimes and law enforcement operational capabilities, among others. In an opening ceremony last Tuesday, for the six-week-long course, the University Registrar, Dr. Babuka Injie, representing the Acting Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Jethro Brooks Jr., reminded his multinational audience about the severity of maritime insecurities in the region over recent years. According to ECOWAS Multinational Maritime Coordination Center, that's the MMC, MMCC Zone F 2020 Annual Report, 136 crew were abducted from 28, 27 kidnapping incidents for the year. This accounted for about 95% of global kidnapping for ransom. Comparatively, the Indian Ocean recorded only 36 incidents, which none were classified as piracy. This made the Gulf of Guinea the most dangerous waters for seafarers worldwide. 
the growing maritime insecurity has affected the legitimate use of the seas, impaired the exploitation of coastal resources, and continue to undermine regional security as well as the realization of the blue economy potential of this region. The project coordinator, engineer Augustus Adilamte, rehashed the importance of continuous maritime domain awareness and training as recent events demonstrate the persistence of the enemy at hand. There are two main objectives for the SWIMS project. The first is governance and law enforcement frameworks and prosecution and adjudication of maritime crimes. And the next one is law enforcement, operational capacities and, uh, and capacities and responses. This second objective is where this IAB project is located. He told I on port later on that this year's program will include first-hand interaction with a survivor of a maritime kidnapping incident. I must say that because of this project, we can see that um, the maritime incidents are reducing and we can, we can say, objectively say that it is because of this project that's why we are seeing such improvements. Maritime law consultant and legal practitioner Dr. Imano Kofimbia also called for continued collaboration among regional partners to remain vigilant in this collective approach the countries in the region have embarked on. We are not out of the woods indeed. Um, the pirates are still around. The economic conditions in our countries are no good and consequently they act as fertile grounds for, um, as it were, engaging or recruiting, you know, people who want to uh, get involved in these nefarious activities. So the challenges are still there, but we need to be vigilant. We need to keep an open mind. We need to ensure that there is uh, collaboration between the various partners. And once the knowledge, information sharing goes on, I'm sure we'll be able to deal with this uh, in very large proportions and large measures. The Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, CILT, has organized a business forum to discuss the cost of doing business in Ghana sports, as well as its implication on import and export trade. The forum had participation from key stakeholders like the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, Shipping Lines, Ghana Express Authority, among other logistics firms. The General Manager for Corporate Planning at the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, Khalid Nuhu, said the Port Authority regulates charging system at the port in a balanced manner by ensuring that private entities don't overcharge and the public also don't underpay for services rendered to them. Everyone that has been licensed or has a concession with GPG operates under the tariffs set by GPG. So if you aggregate the total tariffs of GPG in relation to what has been identified as the component of cost of doing business, one to hundreds, GPHA is less than 10%. He said GPHA has invested a lot in infrastructure at the port to be able to serve the port community in an efficient manner. Khalid Nuru said the elimination of inefficiencies, delays and bureaucracies will go a long way to reduce the cost of doing business at the port. GPHA will try as much as possible to ensure that we are efficient because apart from the direct costs that we see uh, impacting businesses and which we try to control to ensure that where our port users are competitive, the indirect ones are uh, what we try to eliminate inefficiencies, uh, bureaucracies and delays that are implicit in the cost of doing business. Normally we don't talk about that, but for me those are issues that needed to be identified and dealt with so that we as much as possible control the cost of doing business through our ports. An executive member of the Ship Owners and Agents Association of Ghana, Adam Ayana Imoru, said the charges of the shipping lines are to recoup the cost they incur in order for them to stay in business. When I hear people say shipping lines are a rip -off. one minute, oh, shipping lines are a rip -off. They are making cost of doing business in Ghana, uh, Ghana ports very high. The next thing you see in the papers, oh, the ports is very expensive. That's why they are losing cargo to uh, Lome. But both are not true. 
You know, I checked with all the lines here. If they were losing cargo, both Trump and Container, if they are losing cargo to Lumi. And they told me it's not true. Cargo coming to Ghana is coming to Ghana. The head of shipper services and trade facilitation at the Ghana Shippers Authority, Monica Josiah, reviewed some statistics on handling charges by some ports in the West African sub-region. When you look at the ports, government taxes take a greater chunk of the cost. So, for instance, in Tema, we had 91, this was on selected commodities, and in Tema, we had 91.7 percent as government taxes so various government taxes then in abidjan 92.1 then in lome 89.2 the handling charge that's the receipt and um, delivery charge by G uh, gpha was just 2.5 percent tema then abidjan 2.6 and lome about 2.4 i mean they are around the same side then you look at uh, the freight forwarders and MTAs. When you add it, you just I think Tema is in good standing because I think with that Cote d'Ivoire or Abidjan led. Earlier, the global president of CLT, Chief T.T. Owusu-Norte, paid a courtesy call on the Director General of the Ghana Port and Abbas Authority, Michael Luguje, to discuss issues related to transport and logistics that are mutually beneficial. Owusu-Norte, who is the first African and Ghanaian to occupy the CLT higher office, said he was committed to promoting business from Ghana. He commended the Director General of the Ghana Port and Abbas Authority for his continuous support to the Institute. My core interest is to make sure that I promote business primarily from my home country, because there's an adage that says that charity begins at home. I have to strengthen my home base, based on that anytime I'm, I'm on a global platform, I can use Ghana as a case study, which I always do. So I would say that I always whip my country members and whoever in line, because if I don't streamline and whip Ghana in line, and there are issues that go wrong, I'll feel a bit guilty when I'm using such an example, I'll go on a global platform and I'm being referred to negative things that are happening to Ghana. So invariably, what did you do in Ghana that you are coming to, let's say, China to come and correct us? Michael Luguji underscored the importance of logistics in the global supply chain. For GPHA, I mean, you know our, our contribution to that institute in terms of membership. And I think any time there are programs that our assistance is sought. We try to at least contribute our own resources might, might to support. It's an organization that, um, you know, it has all, it is important to be and to remain relevant for the rest of, uh, the rest of time. Because logistics is everything. Yeah. Everything is logistics. We cannot um, ignore its importance. And it's only natural for us to be associated with what is relevant to, uh, to mankind and uh, the movement of goods from A to B. The Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority has vowed to clamp down on diversion of transit cargo in the country. At a stakeholder engagement on securities of transit cargo in Tema, the acting deputy commissioner of the suspense regime, Fletcher Nakoto, said the country loses a lot of revenue as a result of diversion of cargo as the need for all stakeholders to be involved to nip the practice in the bud. From what we gather from the we all agree there is diversion. But the majority of them have complied. So it's our duty now. I mentioned in my remarks that if that attention is not before us, it costs us a lot. Our uh, objective is to make sure that we root out that dimension, the dimension completely. The stakeholder engagement was meant to discuss the issues of overloading and overgauge, overheight of transit vehicles, shedding of overloaded transit vehicles resulting in malfeasance, weight declaration on transit tracks by agents at transit terminal, containerization of fire risk goods, monitoring of transit goods along the corridors to exit point, and introduction of the SIGMAT to strengthen transit goods. The event was also used to solicit challenges transitors face in transporting their goods from the port to their country of origin. The regional maintenance manager of the Ghana Highways Authority for OT region, Albert Annan, called on truck drivers to desist from overloading. Our main objective is to make sure that there's no overloading on the, on the road 
The deputy operations manager at Ghana Link, Emmanuel Kwagbela, said the training will go a long way to facilitate the clearance of transit goods at the ports of Ghana. Usually, in terms of the for us as well. This forum, because of the education that they have had, the number of days that you spend on the road, and the reason why you shouldn't keep too much uh, time on the road is to enable the providers of the tracking devices to get. The transit manager at the port of Tema, David Songotu, called on all stakeholders to collaborate in ensuring that the transit trade rakes in the needed revenue. It is very important that we encourage the trade because if I told you this minute that we have over 2,000 people working because of this trade, earning their livelihood. All right, so welcome back. Those were some happenings in the port and shipping industry in the course of the week. We are now going to take the word of phrase of the day. And remember, the word of phrase of the day has been fashioned to bring you up to speed with the terminologies and jargons we use in the shipping industry. Today's word is short shipped. Short shipped. Short shipped. Short ship refers to a cargo missing a vessel that it was originally intended for. All right, so welcome back. We are zooming into our discussion proper tonight, and tonight we are taking a look at how to ensure sustainability of Ghana fishery sector uh, using best practices. And uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce to us uh, in the studios, we have Mr. Rick Stani Ama Amafio, who's no stranger to Iron Port. He is the Executive Director of the Blue Economy and Governance Consult. He's the Vice President, actually, of NAFAG, yes. And uh, he does a lot of stuff for the tuna industry as well. And uh, to join us via Zoom uh, will be Dr. Jemima Etonam Kasa. She's a fishery scientist, a lecturer at uh, the Department of Biology, Education, University of Education, Winneba. Uh, good evening, Doc, and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening once again, and it's nice meeting everyone. Good evening, Rich Star. Awesome. All right. So uh, let me uh, start with you, uh, Doc, since you are online. Uh, let me begin with you and uh, try to find out from you what the key challenges are uh, facing the, sh the fishery sector in Ghana, uh, particularly in terms of su sustainability, if you would oblige us. Yes. Um, thank you very much once again. I would want to say, first of all, though, that a lot of strides have been made in the fishery sector so far. And if we are to ensure sustainability, we, we would have to keep at the various interventions, as well as also step up enforcement, as well as um, alternative livelihood strategies. These three things are very important. We need to continue with the interventions so far, make sure enforcement and prosecution is top notch, as well as also promote sustainable and alternative livelihoods. And um, as we go on, we'll go into deeper details about some of these strategies. Right. So I'm still sticking with you briefly. I just want to find out from you uh, about the issue of overfishing, how this is impacting the Ghana, uh, Ghana's fisheries industry, uh, the ecosystem, marine ecosystem in Ghana, and uh, what measures are being taken, if you are aware, uh, to address some of these issues. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I'm glad Rista is there, so I'll speak for the artisanal sector. Um, we had an issue due to open access as well as overcapacity. Um, but in recent months, um, there have been various interventions, such as the moratorium on entry for canoes. So as of last year, new canoes couldn't, cannot go into the fishery, the artisanal fishery. Um, for the next three years. So if we're talking about this year, that means for two more years, no new canoes are going to be allowed into the fishery sector. 
um, there are quite a number of other interventions, such as prosecution, um, formation of committees, uh, marine protected, uh, the designation of a marine protected area, as well as the adoption of the 2022 to 2026 Marine Fisheries Management Plan. Um, that being said, there are still a few threats to our marine fisheries. First of all, there's still the issue of illegalities in the fisheries sector. And although there are a lot of interventions now, talk about the electronic monitoring system on industrial vessels, um, as well as um, formation of landing beach committees, we still find in incidences of fishermen still using illegal fishing methods to maximize the catch. However, um, because our fisheries, our fish stocks went down to very low levels, um, the fear is that um, if we don't do anything, we may have actually gotten to that point where the stock, the stock number, the stock numbers are so low that it's going to take quite some time to um, for us to get any appreciable gains. Um, added to that is the fact that, for example, we have the closed fishing season and it would take most of our small pelagics a year to two years for them to go to market size. But right after the closed fishing season, we are still seeing um, the use of very small size fishing nets we call poly nets, which in effect are also taking out the juveniles or the new hatchlings are out of the system. Also bringing climate change and pollution, and we're seeing so many other things going on. Now, um, the threat is that when you have overfishing and then the numbers of key species dwindle, it affects what we call the food chain. And let me give an example of a food chain we have mm. in our fishery. Right. Um, so we have our plankton being the small organisms that are floating in the water which are fed on by um, anchovies, what we call um, emone or amoni. Amoni, yeah. In turn, the, mac yeah, the mackerel, which we call salmon, which shouldn't be called salmon, but the mackerels, they prefer the anchovies. Mm. And then from there, the tunas feed on the mackerel, and then you have the dolphins and the bigger billfishes coming in. Right. In the event where a uh, small pelagic, say the anchovies get overfished, is going to have a domino effect um, down or up the food chain, if I should put it that way. Mm. And then the apex predators or those um, consumers that will feed on these, what we call forage fishes, we realize that their numbers will also get affected. Um, let's bring in the interplay of pollution. Um, for example, where we now have a lot of silt and sediment from our rivers that are being affected by galamse right. going into the ocean. Um, we also have underwater some remnants of reefs or coral reefs or rocks yeah. where a lot of our demersals, be they red fishes, what we call the spirits, groupers and others, and um, where they also spawn or lay their eggs. But we are realizing that as more and more layers of this fine sediment is going out, it's smothering the eggs that these species are laying and making survival go down. Um, let's even talk about heavy metals, the potential impacts of the continual deposition of mercury, arsenic, cyanide, and other metals into the ocean. Over time, these levels are going to accumulate in our fish species, and they also come with their own public health implications, both for the ecosystem and for humans as well. Right. I'll be going to Mr. Amafio shortly, but before that, I would have you tell us uh, more about this uh, Marine Fisheries ma uh, Management Plan. I think this is my first time, first time of uh, hearing it. Okay, so um, the Marine Fisheries Management Plan of Ghana 2022-2026 um, is um, a management plan that virtually um, is talking about various interventions that will be carried out by the state and various partners, both stakeholders and donor agencies in ensuring the sustainability of our fisheries. Um, we've had various management plans in the past, but this new management plan has um, 
gleaned a lot from um, what has been learned in previous years when it comes to things that went wrong as well as lessons learned. So we are seeing um, greater emphasis on enforcement, um, alternative livelihood strategies, reduction of fishing effort, create, creation of protected areas, um, factoring in um, climate change implications, among other things into the plan for how Ghana wants to move forward when it comes to regulating or managing her marine fishery space. So in brief, that's the new marine fisheries management plan in place. And it was put together with a lot of input from various stakeholders in the industry. Okay, right. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, please don't leave us out. Come to in studio now and uh, speak to Mr. Amar Mafia and find out from you how um, artisanal uh, and then uh, industrial fishing is impacting sustainability uh, in terms of uh, you know their, their impact of the sector. Well, like what role do they play, so to speak? Well, like Doc said, um, I'm sure you are aware we have various sectors. We have uh, even with the artisanal, we have the inshore and then um, canoe. Yes, and then we have the industrial troll, and then we have the industrial tuna. So basically, for the marine sector, we have four subsectors. Um, the artisanal, artisanal sector are allowed to fish within what we call the inshore exclusive zone. Right. So that is uh, six nautical miles, miles, six nautical miles, or thirty meter contour depth. Right. Whichever is further. So when we say which, so, if you get to a thirty meter contour depth, you are not at the six nautical mile. Mm. Then the applicable distance will be the six nautical mile. Right. So if you get to six nautical mile and you are not yet within a 30 meter contour depth, then applicable depth will be the 30 meter contour depth. Right. So that's the initial exclusive, exclusive zone. Yeah. And so you allow only the artisanal sector, which is the inshore sector and the trust and, and the canoe people to fish within the IEZ. Right. Now the challenge is that you, when you have smaller fish species, especially when the fish spawn, yeah. they migrate closer to shore. Mm. And because we do not regulate the mesh size, you probably allow the artisanal sector to fish the smaller fish or the juvenile yes. most of the time. Yes. Especially when they are using the, the, and the less than an inch mesh, mesh. size. Yeah. You are, you've also observed that we have a lot of beach seining. Yes. Uh, those who drag the net at the beach. Yes. And when you go and you observe their catches, mm. most of their catches are juvenile. Right. And small fish. Absolutely. So you have beach seining all over the coast. And a lot of them do their beach seining close to estuaries. Right. And so the relationship between the estuary and the ocean uh, also aids in spawning. Right. So you create a lot of challenge when they spawn around the estuary, but you have a lot of rich resources around the estuary. So when they spawn, the beach scene around the estuary, you create a lot of challenges. Right. The numbers that we have, 12,000 canoes, is been proven to be too much. Mm. And so it becomes a challenge in terms of what we are landing. Right. And then we need to do reclassification of the artisanal sector. Right. When we were young, most of the canoes were smaller. Mm -hmm. Now, you have very big canoes mm. that may have to be reclassified as commercial canoes, canoes yeah. rather than just classifying them as artisanal canoes. Right. Because if you don't do the reclassification, then it becomes difficult for you to manage them. Mm. Because some of them have very big and wide fishing nets mm. that needed to be managed beyond just treating them as artisanal activity. Mm. So for the artisanal sector, these are key issues. You, we, she spoke about the closure on the entry yes. of new canoes. That is the directive. For two that, years. Yeah, that's the directive. Yes. You see, unfortunately, it is not the Ministry of Fisheries that regulates the forestry. It's right. the Forestry Commission. And one challenge you have is that for example, we, we did not cap it. So the Forestry Commission may have issued permit already for some people to harvest the tree, or some people may have already harvested the tree. Yeah. So even though there is a closure to entry, the closure may only affect new harvesting mm. and not those that have been harvested already and are there and being carved to be used.
as Kenu. Yes. So you may find new Kenus that are entry because they may already have had their permit and the trees may have been harvested. It mm. is also good in the preservation of our forest. Right. That's very important. But then, probably we may have to extend it to our five years mm. in order that we have an early cap and then you have a longer period that you don't have entry. Now, when you are not getting entry, the next thing you might have to do is to look for alternative, mm. not just alternative livelihood, yeah. but alternative trade for younger persons who are in the fishing industry. Right. Because if you provide them, and I've always said this, that provide them with basic literacy mm. and numeracy mm. and let them develop it so that they are able to move out of the industry because when they start reading and writing and they begin to understand, they'll do things differently. They may want to explore other opportunities. Absolutely. Some may want to have further education. Right. Because if you do not create that avenue, mm. then you have a challenge of creating a lot of un unemployment right. because um, there won't be new addition to the industry. Mm. And then they are mono-skilled, and so they are, there are no space for them in the industry. Right. So they may now become redundant, and that become a danger. Mm. So whereas you are implementing the policy on reducing the entry into the industry. One of the things we need to look at is how do we create opportunities for younger fishers to learn trade, to have education, uh, normal numeracy education, those mm. who can, so that they now become useful to themselves beyond just fishing. Right. If we are able to do that successfully, even those who go back to fish will fish differently because now they fish with some level of understanding Absolutely. and some level of education. Mm. Probably those are some of the things we still need to do for the artisanal sector. Mm. Now, when you come to the industrial sector, the key factor in the industrial sector has to do with the trawl sector. Right. The trawl sector has been so much regulated. Um, we currently have less than 50 trawl vessels mm. that are fish, fishing. And I'm, I'm, in the whole of last year, there were no issues of um, illegality uh, that we, was recorded within the sector. Okay. What is happening now is that those issues that existed, mm. the committee is arbitrating on them, and those who have to be fined are being fined. It right. means that we brought some sanity within the trust sector. And it's taking a lot of effort to get here. Right. Um, a lot, some of the vessels are, trawl vessels are already out of our system. They are gone. Mm. Uh, no new entrance is being allowed. Right. And I've served a few cases of replacement, and replacement are one on one. Right. Now, the Ghana Maritime Authority is also ensuring that the crew go through the requisite training before they embark right. on the vessels. So the, we've been complaining the regional maritime university was not training. Now they have even given some subsidy mm. in terms of uh, the training. Right. And so instead of paying so much, companies are paying less. Right. And so there is an arrangement. And the tuna sector is going through that, mm. that the fishers are going to have the mandatories, the five mandatories, right. and then be trained properly to be able to be on the vessel and at least adhere to all the safety measures that one need to adhere to when you are in the vessel. Mm. So a lot is happening within the industry amongst the various stakeholders that are in there. Yes. And it's not just the training. Mm. The training also comes with awareness of matters that borders on illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. Are you, yeah. Currently... Um, we are working closely with the International Labour Organization on the issues of um, CI, uh, C188, mm. that's the uh, ILO um, uh, CI18. That has to do with the basically the decent work for yeah. the fishermen right. to ensure that fishers are paid well, mm. fishers are treated well, they meet, they, they get all the necessary training, and they enjoy whatever they have to enjoy, right. including their right to working for eight hours mm. and then getting overtime 
allowance when they work beyond eight hours. Right. So a lot is happening. And at the last um, tripartite meeting between the ILO, IMO, and then the FAO in Switzerland, yeah. they basically declared um, the issue of worker safety and all of that right. as part of IU. Okay. So it means that if you are not paying your workers well, you are not paying their uh, social security and all of that, it is considered that you are engaged in an illegal Illegality, system. yeah. So even the worker safety is come to play mm. within the industrial sector. Mm. And you see that there's a lot of improvement because the trust sector now has a different um, net or gear design right. compared to what they used to have. Mm. What that was intended for was to reduce the quantum of bycatch that they were harvesting, right. that they were shipping as cycle, mm. and to ensure that they only get their target species. Right. And that also means sustainability. Mm. What probably we need to do as a country is to go beyond just what happens within the fishing industry. Right. Because a lot of regulation is going on in the fishing industry. Jimama was talking about the environment. Yes. And I've said this several times, that the fish lives within an environment. Mm. The, the phytoplankton and all of that are yeah. part of the food chain mm. that the fish depends on. So any act of pollution, particularly plastic pollution, yes. pollution of our estuaries and lagoons yeah. and all of that, contribute to the destruction of our fishes' habitat. Right. They contribute to the destruction of the entire food value chain. Yeah. And yes, the, the sardinella stalks may eat the anchovies, and the anchovies, uh, the tunas and others may eat the sardinella. Yeah. The um, red snappers and the groupers may eat the sardinellas and all of that. Mm. But ultimately, you also eat the fish. Right. So when the fish eat heavy metals and it gets into their tissue, and then you end up eat, eating, yeah, with, sure. That get that food on your table. Yeah. You end up taking in heavy metal into your system. Yeah. So it's not just the fish that yeah. is affected. Yeah. But for the us humans, as yeah. end consumers yeah. of the fish product, yeah. suffer the consequences of our own negligence Absolutely. on the land. I agree. And that is why we we have a responsibility to go beyond what the fisherman does. Mm to what you and myself always do at home, yeah. which m have impact, mm. direct impact on our health. Right. We, we seem to forget that. And so we feel that, well, it is a fisherman's problem. Mm. It's not a fisherman's problem. It is a national problem. Mm. It is our problem that we have to treat our environment properly. Yeah. We, we allow a lot of oil in our water bodies. Mm. We basically have turned almost all our water bodies into some waste dump, yeah. they end up, most of them end up in the ocean. Even if they don't end up in the ocean. Now people have developed the likeness for um, cuttlefish yeah. and tilapia. Mm. They are also in the water. Yeah. They exist in the same water where the miners pollute. Mm. And so you, you end up taking tilapia or cuttlefish. They are freshwater fish, yeah. but you end up polluting your, your right. system. So... It's not a fisherman's problem. Mm. It is a national problem. It is you and I, yeah. our problem, yeah. to ensure that we keep our water bodies clean. clean. We keep our water bodies away from pollutants yeah. so that we end up eating the right kind of fish. All right. You mentioned something like five mandatories. Yeah. If you can just briefly tell us what, what they are. Well, so um, to be a fisherman, you must know how to do firefighting. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you're on the vessel at sea... Yes and there is fire, mm. you can't call fire service to come to sea right. to help you fight fire. Mm. So every fisherman on the vessel must know how to use the fire extinguisher and all of that yes. to fight fire. You need to know how to swim. So you, you need to be able to at least swim to save yourself in case of yeah, an accident. Absolutely. And then we have safety equipments on the vessel that every fisherman needs to be able to use. Yes. And those are the mandatories that they, they go through training to learn. Right. And so they are basic survival skills that they need to acquire. Mm. And it is compulsory that you, you have those basic survival skills before you even board the vessel. Right. Even the observers. So this time around, 
we have had the observers go through the basic survival skills right. to be able to fit in the system. Because, you see, the observers spend the whole period with the vessel at yeah, sea. Yeah. So you don't just put an observer on the vessel and say that, oh, you are an observer, so you are different. They are not different from yeah. the fishermen because Absolutely. whatever happens to the vessel will happen to them whilst Absolutely. they are on the vessel. Yeah. So for this time around, all the observers that were boarded had also gone through the basic survival, survival skills mm. to be able to board the vessel because they, they are required to also know mm. how to survive at sea. Right. And so I think that is one important step for you, forward. Mm. But beyond that, we need to now teach specific skills right. so that we can have our own crew uh, manage basically every sector within the vessel. Right. That is cheaper for industry, mm. and it is better for Ghana because we improve on the employment rate and we, we are able to pay them better. Yeah, okay. All right. Awesome. So let me go back to um, uh, Dr. Jemima if she... Uh, still on the line, and find out from you uh, whether you can discuss some effect the effectiveness of current regulatory frameworks and the enforcement mechanisms that have been put in place, uh, so to speak, uh, to deal with uh, you know the problems in the fisheries sector. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as I said earlier, a lot is being done so far in terms of um, sustainability, but mm. there's still much more to be done. Right. Um, as Rista rightly said, um, the industrial sector is really doing well with compliance. Mm. Um, but the problem we are facing right now is that due to the sheer numbers of um, fishermen that we have, over 12,000, yes. it's getting, you know, getting hold of all of them in terms of enforcement. It, it's becoming very difficult. So for us to really do better, um, we need to extend the range and the depth of coverage when it comes to enforcement, especially in the artisanal sector. In addition to that, um, sometimes the punitive measures are quite paltry. So sometimes offenders just pay something and then they, they get off the hook. Um, talking about the example of um, the troll gear, um, which has currently been changed and modified, and now the um, inshore and industrial sectors are compliant. Uh, we realize that in the canoe um, sector, um, you can virtually adapt or adjust your gear to whatever length you want to. So maybe I have one canoe and I have about seven crew members, and now I don't get, um, say, my 20 head pounds of fish. It's just a matter of extending the length and breadth of my net to maximize my, my catch. And that's also quite a, a big issue we are having. Um, Rista was also pointing out that um, just proposing alternative livelihoods may not really be the solution in total. We have high, um, low literacy rates in our coastal communities. If we can push for education right from um, the childhood stage, because we realize that a lot of them truncate their education after basic school, the more the um, literacy rate goes up, we believe that that would also lead to more empowerment and career or um, livelihood options for them. Okay, so uh, we cannot talk about uh, fishery sustainability without talking about uh, climate change and uh, you know environmental degradation and all that. How do these impact you know uh, you know fisheries the fishery sector in our country? Thank you very much. Got it. So um, currently, we, we are experiencing a lot of um, effects of climate change, mostly negative. Um, currently, worldwide, um, last year was the hottest year ever recorded. And this year, February, as of the last calculations, February was the hottest month of the year worldwide. Um, some of the implications of these are that um, because Ghana is a coastal upwelling um, nation where the coastal upwelling drives our fishery. If we have very high temperatures, it clearly means that the strength of our upwelling will go down, mm. and that of affects um, productivity of plankton um, as well as um, 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 reproduction and then survival of juveniles or eggs. Because when the eggs hatch, it means that the plankton numbers are going to be very low, which will affect 
survival and therefore recruitment into the fishery. The other thing about the warming of our oceans is that as the oceans warm, we are also going to see changes in wind speed and wind direction. Right. And now um, in, in our ocean, we have zones that are mostly for spawning or let's say breeding. And then after these um, fish hatch, the young are carried off by currents into nursery areas where there's plentiful food and then they feed on that and they grow as juveniles and then migrate to join the adults. Mm. Um, one consequence of our warming oceans is that it affects the wind speed as well as the direction of the wind. Right. So if this goes on, what's going to happen is that the, the juveniles that are supposed or the, the, the fingerlings that are, have been hatched and are supposed to be driven by currents into nursery areas where they have their feeding grounds are literally going to be blown off course. So there's going to be a mismatch between the juveniles and then them accessing um, the rich feeding grounds they need to be at so they can grow and join the, the adult stock, which is what we call affecting recruitment. The mm. other thing is also that as we have warmer temperatures, Species that do not prefer um, water of that temperature would have to migrate further offshore into colder or deeper waters. And when that happens, you are going to realize that they will now move out of reach, especially of the artisanal fishers. And currently, there are complaints that they need to expend more fuel to go and, you know, harvest um, their stock. Right. Um, so the fish are literally moving out of reach of range of the artisanal fishes. And the other thing, um, which is what Richter mentioned, is that it's also going to cause conflicts between the artisanal fishes and then the inshore and the industrial fishermen, because then you have the artisanal fishes moving within, you know, the fishing grounds of, of the industrial vessels, which leads to several misunderstandings and conflicts. Mm. At, so this makes the issue of sea level rise um, and storm surges. Um, currently, when you go to the Volta region, we have two to three communities. There is Kuverme and Akolotoko, which right. have disappeared from the map. Mm. Um, these were fishing communities. They were by the coast. But as a result of high um, tidal, um, let's say, storm surges, these villages have been wiped off the map. And more and more of our coastal communities, especially along the eastern coast, have become very, very vulnerable. It's just a matter of time before they also um, disappear. So we have all these things affecting the, the marine space, throw in the pollutants, both plastic and heavy metal, as well as um, runoff from increased fertilizer and herbicide and weedicide use on land. And all these are ending up in the ocean. Mm. Um, we spoke about the public health implications. Yes. But then we are also seeing these days as fisheries biologists that um, you dissect the fish and you are recording higher incidences of tumors. And truly, we do have tumors. You find tumors in fish as well. You're having had so many, you know, previously um, low reports of some of these things and all these things are on the rise. So you have all these coming together to really affect the sustainability of our fisheries. So we are doing so much, but if we continue with our um, anthropogenic activities that are having a deleterious effect on the ecosystem, yeah. it's going to affect both the ecosystem and us, the, the, the consumers, as the apex consumers in this food chain. Right. I'll, I'll give you a last question, and then uh, when you leave us, we'll go for a break, and then I'll, we'll, we'll do the in-studio uh, discussion. That has to do with the socioeconomic implications of unsustainable fishing practices on coastal communities in Ghana. Can you tell us something about it, uh, you know, and if so, what are some of the factors that contribute to some of these issues? So the fishery sector of Ghana provides employment both directly and indirectly to 10% of Ghana's population. Mm. So um, as Richter said, it's time we, we divorce fisheries issues to just thinking about the fish and the water and the fishermen. You have the women processors who take the fish from the men, process it. You have drivers who take the fish right from the coastal communities into the hinterlands. 
you have market women in the hinterlands who also, you know, serve as retailers for this fish all the way, not only in Ghana, but our fish goes to other parts of West Africa and right. even minimally for export. At the same time, you have people within the value chain, such as people who are dealing in ice block, um, refrigeration systems, packaging, entrepreneurs who are trying to sell um, processed fish on social media. And all these people are in the value chain. So if we have a collapse of the fishery, the people going to be affected are not just the fishermen, but then every other player or actor along this value chain, from mechanics to outboard motor repairers, to um, gear developers, to boat builders, all these people are having their livelihoods threatened. And currently, even if we just look at the fishery sector for now, um, due to low catches, there's a lot of pressure on families that are tied to our fishery because there, there's low income levels. Um, women don't have fish to smoke. So instead of them working literally all day long, all week long, they are only able to smoke fish, say, two out of three days out of the week. And that's a big financial drain. What happens then in the coastal communities? We have high levels of um, depression. Um, people are hypertensive, all these other, you know, health issues that come as a result of increased stress levels. Um, a lot is being done to reduce rates of child trafficking, but as a consequence of um, low catches, there have been reports of parents in these fishing communities having to make their children go out to serve as domestic servants um, with other families and this is truncating their schooling, among others. So um, there are a lot of socioeconomic implications of declining fisheries um, on the Ghanaian society. And it's not just maybe the, the, the fish catch is going down, so it's affecting the fishes. In addition to that, um, we know that fish is supposed to be the cheapest source of animal protein. But you and I, we can both bear witness that if you go to the market right now, you want to buy kinky. Gone are the days when you could get fried fish for two CDs and you'll be okay with it. Mm. Right now, for just one ball of kinky, you need to buy fried fish um, in excess of 10 CDs, literally, because what you get for five CDs is nothing to write home about. And this These is days, well, I understand when you, go to buy, when you go to buy the fried fish and they, tell, they mention the price and you say it's expensive, the... The, the people say it's the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, elsewhere they'll tell you the fish is just not there. There's no fish, you know. So right. it becomes very expensive. And this is also going to lead to increased malnutrition. Yeah. Because yeah. if um, medical officers are advising parents, for example, to give um, powdered um, sardinellas in the diet of toddlers, for example, yeah. and now you go to the market and you have three pieces of m &E, small sardinella going for five CDs. How is the mother who probably sells oranges going to ensure that her, her child gets all their adequate protein needs? And yeah. that's a huge problem we are grappling with. Right. It's not just on the fishing communities, but it affects every actor in the value chain and it affects the nation as a whole. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Doc. We are most grateful to you uh, for joining us, uh, Dr. Uh, Jemima Etonam Kasa is a fishery scientist, lecturer, Department of Biology, Education, University of Education, Winneba. We thank you so much for obliging us this evening. Uh, it's always a delight to speak to you. And uh, we believe that as and when the need arises, uh, we would reach out to you and we would always have that favorable response from you. Thank you so much, Doc, and have a super week ahead. Uh, remember, this is our import here on uh, Metropolitan Television. And tonight, we are taking a look at best practices in ensuring fisheries sustainability in Ghana. Also with us in the studios, Mr. Rickster Ni Ama Mafio, Executive Director of the Blue uh, Economy and Governance Consult. He is also the Vice President of the National Fisheries Association of Ghana, NAFAG, yes, absolutely. And uh, he, like I said, he also does a lot of uh, things for the tuna industry as well. We're going for a quick break. When we return, we'll uh, take your messages and then we shall activate the phone lines and we'll continue the discussion uh, in studio. Please stay with us. <laughs> Guys, now I'm tired. I'll go on a date with whoever gets here first. Princess, really? Okay. Are they come? Shut Mommy, for the mechanic, I'm watching. Boss, 
fill my tank with Super XP Run 95. Fill up with Super XP Run 95 and Diesel XP high performance products from Goyle. <laughs> Sorry, Tony got here first, so I'm stepping with him. Oh, cut him, cut him. Hey! Go for that boy, mommy. Choose Super XP Run 95 and Diesel XP for an energizing driving experience. Always go for Goyle Super XP Run 95. Goyle. Good energy. Taxes, our future. Because you see, without our taxes, we wouldn't have good roads, good schools, better hospitals, street lights, and other very important social amenities. When we pay our taxes, we give our children free and quality education. Tell that my money too small. Why should I pay my tax? Look, small. Sellful. It doesn't matter how small or big your business or income is. You still have to pay your taxes. The little taxes from each and every one of us, when put together, could give your community clean water or that deprived school with tables and chairs. Please pay your taxes. It is your responsibility. It is your civic duty. It is the law. Impressive factory. If only I had listened to you, I wouldn't have been in this mess. That devastating fire virtually wiped out the whole factory and my warehouse. Remember my misfortunes last year? Serene insurance assets all risk fire policies that I took were there to pay for my damaged stocks in the warehouse. And my machines that were affected by the floods have been replaced. My accident vehicle is back on the road. Thanks to Serene Insurance Motor Policy. Currently, my goods are on the high seas covered with the marine cargo insurance policy. I was just telling Ajima about Serene Insurance. Oh, Ajima. Tell him more. As a road contractor, I make sure I do my contractors all risk insurance for the projects and then workers compensation for all the workers on site with serene insurance they will make sure they will cover your unknown tomorrow today serene insurance a new face of insurance call us now MPS Terminal 3 is Africa's new state-of-the-art container terminal at Tema Port. For manufacturers, agro-processors and traders, the new port means business can be done faster. This infrastructure boost will improve Ghana's port handling capacity, connect more trading routes and oil the engine of growth for the economy, creating great opportunities across all sectors as Africa's markets merge and become the largest trading block globally. MPS, we connect, you thrive. Business and life can be like the sea sometimes. Sometimes serene, sometimes calm. Sometimes turbulent, and at times, it brings the unexpected. However it is like, trust Phoenix Insurance for your home, car, business, and marine insurance needs. Call 0302. 246319 or 0243 690 At Phoenix, you experience a delightful service delivered with wisdom. You're welcome back. This is Aaron Port here on Metropolitan Television, and tonight we are taking a look at how to uh, ensure uh, the sustainability of Ghana's fishery sector using best practices. And uh, you heard uh, Dr. Jemima Etonam Kasa, uh, who is a fishery scientist and a lecturer. Uh, the Department of Biology Education at the University of Education, Wiliba. Uh, she was uh, on Zoom a while ago, and uh, she's left us. And uh, we are now coming to do the in-house uh, discussion with uh, uh, Mr. Rick Stani Ama Amafio, who is the Executive Director of the Blue Economy and Gov Governance Consult. Uh, he's also the Vice President of the National uh, Fishermen Association of Ghana, NAFAG. And indeed, uh, my question to you, uh, Rick Star, would be uh, international agreements and... Uh, uh, international agreements and partnerships, how they contribute to fishery sustainability in Ghana. And I know there's a project that you are championing. You, in fact, you are one of the lead players in this particular uh, project titled uh, 
promoting sustainable fisheries in Ghana through a U.S. study tour uh, for Ghanaian f uh, fisheries stakeholders. And uh, I think this is a tour that uh, is located at the University of uh, Rhode Island in Kingston, that's Rhode Island. And it has uh, several, you know, benefits and all that. I just want to find out from you um, what this whole uh, uh, thing is about, this project is about. Yes. The first one has to do with international agreements. And, and partnerships, the, and, how and, that and, helps in sustainability of our um, fishery sector. Well, yes. we, uh, when it comes to the fishery sector, mm. what we have tried not to do mm. is to have the bilateral agreement that other countries have with the EU right. that allow them access for, into their fishery. Mm. And to me, I think we've been able to manage that very well. We allow access um, as the law requires yes. that the uh, company may apply through an agent to bring his vessels to come and fish in our waters. Yes. And then the, particularly tuna, which will count against the country's quota. Because right. tuna is fish on quota. Mm. Um, but we, we do not have a clear bilateral fisheries agreement that allow them to come and fish in our waters or take over our fisheries. And mm. what we need to do is to develop indigenous capacity to be able to manage and exploit, exploit our resources very well. Right. Now, the second leg has to do with the fishery study tour yes. in the University of Rhode Island. Yes. And that was a study tour... I initiated right um, when I was uh, doing a voluntary work with the Ghana Industrial Trolls Association. Association. Okay. Um, at the time, there was some World Bank funding mm. it, uh, that was in 2016. Mm. There was this World Bank fund that. Okay. Uh, so before you continue, let's announce the phone lines. Uh, uh, you can call in uh, if you will uh, to contribute to the discussion, and the number to dial is right there on your screen. Uh, 20 8353 You can call in and then contribute to the discussion. Please continue. There sir. was this World Bank fund, $53.8 million, and that has a grant component. Right. So uh, part of the grant component was for capacity building. Okay. And you realize that at the time, uh, the trust sector was being considered the most notorious sector in the, in, in, in the sector. Yes. So what I was trying to do was to help them get it right. Mm -hmm. So I volunteered to work for them uh, so we could get it right, right. and create a better trust sector and a better image. Right. So uh, then also there was a sustainable fisheries development project under a USAID project. Mm. So we tried to see if we could assess part of the funds to travel to the United States. Right. Because the SFMP project was a University of Rhode Island project. Okay. And uh, some of us had very good relationships relation with the managers of the project, particularly right. uh, Brian Crawford and Naji uh, Lazare. Right. So we approached them to discuss the possibility of understanding what happens in the U.S. and why the U.S. got it right mm. after a long time of overexploitation. Right. So one of the things they did right. Uh, was the gear selectivity. So the 2015 tour, which we eventually went mm. with industry people and then one person from in academia, Dr. Isaac Ochi from the University of Cape Coast, right. was to learn about gear selectivity. Okay. So the USAID project funded part of it and industry people also funded part of it. So we went to the United States, University of Rhode Island, and we did a tour of the New England region right. to look at how they, they use gear selectivity for sustainable fisheries. Right. Beyond that, how industry and academia work together mm. in collaborative research to be able to deal with challenges that confronted the industry. Right. So basically, that was how it was started. Unfortunately, we didn't get a World Bank part of the grant, mm. so we had to now fund our part of the grant of, of the project to go to the uh, United States and come. Yeah. Then in 2007, because the 2015 project was successful, in 2017, we had to go again. Right. But in 2015, there was one other success that we, 
that had to do with collaborative research because I said the other bit was a collaborative research. research yeah. So we then decided to look at alternative, particularly for the insurance sector, in order to reduce the issue of light fishing. Mm. And that we realized that um, cuttlefish was quite common mm. and was available. Yeah. So we were looking at whether it was possible to even do uh, hatch them in the lab, right? Which was successfully hatched uh, under the supervision of Dr. Izikochi, but right. all of us contributed to the project. Mm. So that was what we call the collaborative research, and that research information is available. Right. So it means that it's possible to hatch cuttlefish in the laboratory, mm. and then probably you could move a step further and see whether we could even culture them. Right. And I'm sure in the future, we may look at the possibility of culturing cuttlefish. Right. So in 2017, we decided that, okay, then we'll go with policy people to look at how policy issues are dealt with. And one other issue that came out of the 2016 tour was the close season. Mm. So the trust that I agreed as part of the image cleansing process to right. start the close season. And so in November 2016, we had the first close season with assurance that January, February, the trust center was going to have the second close season mm. in 2017, which happened in January, February 2017. Right. And then they have since been having the close season, and now it is July, August. Okay. So this was part of the arrangements we made in the Rhode Island. Mm, mm, mm. Then in 2017, when with the policy, so when the director of fisheries, the um, chief director of the fisheries commission, um, the head of the research division, one person from the marine division, mm. and then um, so when five people from the commission and the ministry, right, and then uh, four people from industry, right, to look at some of the things we've looked at already, and then look at how the fisheries commission and fisheries governance is done, right. So we were in Norfolk mm. to understand the fisheries. Commission meeting and how they conduct the official commission activities. Mm, mm. And then we went to um, NOAA, N uh, National Geographic and Atmospheric Agency, yes. to look at how they also conduct the activities at NOAA in, um, in Maryland. Yeah. So we, we had a lot of ex exposure yeah. with the industry people. Right. Then 2019, we felt that, okay, if the executive or the regulators have had the exposure, we, we have a problem with parliament right. understanding the issues. Because uh, we have a committee on a Greek that basically the members do not understand anything at all about the fishing industry. Right. So now let's take the members of parliament. So my company sponsored two members of parliament mm. uh, in leadership. So you know we took five members of parliament the chairman and the ranking member, right, and three other people. So we had three people from the governing party, and then two people from the um, minority, right, to go with them to the University of Rhode Island, and the new. And but then there were industry people also in attendance. Okay, and I think there were people from the executive who also attended. So now we had industry, we had the executive, and then we had the parliament all going with us to the University of Rhode Island. And there was always a classroom work, and then there were field work. We even go fishing. Okay. On all of the uh, tour, we okay. went fishing. All right. We went fishing. When we can, we continue from there. Yeah. I understand we have Nana, who's calling us from Dodo. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you? I'm terrific, Vice Grace Nana. I hope you are doing well, too. God willing, we are doing well. Awesome. Please shoot, sir. Congratulations on the, the, the the discussion you are having on, on the television. Thank you very much, Nana. Thank I, you. I am right sitting by my television. You are? I'm right sitting by the television watching. Okay, sir. Right. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, something like this have to be well treated so that we, the local people, you mm. understand? And now we see there's no job, no job, no job. But there is a job that we could create, like what you are discussing. Uh, a local person need just a small push for him to actually come and then uh, uh, bring himself out, even create job opportunity for people. So I am encouraging and then uh, actually telling you well done 
for what you are doing. And also, me for one, if I should get it as a full-time job. You know, one time I visited one farmer at uh, Ayikuma. Mm. Uh, one Mr. Kweku, so, 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 and so. You go there, he has got these fish ponds, and he has got a lot of uh, uh, these catfish. And he employs some guys, they are looking after this uh, pond and this thing for him. And my, my, my brother, if you look at how nice it is, right. and the amount of fish that he told me, one pond will contain about 2,000 fishes. That is uh, the thing yeah. in the one. You see that, yes, we are sitting on gold, but we are looking out for silver, which maybe we may not get. So please, uh, I'll be an emissary of your project or your program to, to the whole world as well as to Mother Ghana. So that, uh, yes, jo the job all over the country, a mm. world where what canker is job uh, unemployment. Right. And the jobs are right there. Yes. So please, well done. And I wish, I wish you continue it and make it almost every day, every day program for all of us to copy, especially with schools. Uh -huh. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much, Nana. Uh, Nana uh, is calling Nana Okofu Doche. He's calling us from Dodo. We're grateful to you. He says we are sitting on a gold mine, and uh, he gave us an example of a friend whose farm he visited, and you know the fish ponds and how ma how many fingerlings are introduced in each fish pond, and you know how that is yielding a lot of dividends for this particular person. So please, uh, Mr. Yeah. So we we Matthew. went with the members of Parliament, mm, mm. and they they learnt so much, mm. and. That also changed the relationship between industry and parliament because now we had a, a, a parliamentary committee that yes. have an appreciation of the fishery sector issues. Yes. 2020 and 21, because of COVID, we didn't go. Yes. But 2022, we went back. And this time we went to the Minister for Fisheries. Okay. And her team, her technical advisors, mm. members of parliament, and industry people, and academia. Uh, yes. So... We had a, a very solid team uh, that included people like Prof. Dennis Ayeto and yes. the minister, uh, our commission, the uh, ranking member, and then the chairman of the Select Committee on Food, Agri, and Cocoa Affairs, yes. and leadership within industry. Mm. And uh, we, we, we also had somebody from the Department of State of, from the U.S. Embassy in Ghana so joining, okay. going with us, and right. somebody from the... Um, Ghana Fisheries Recovery Activity. So okay. we had a wider team right. that attended the 2022 program. Mm. Now, fast, fast forward to 2023 and 2024. Can you bring us up to speed? No, we, we, have didn't, barely, we, we have barely four minutes to wrap we up. We were supposed to do 2023. Mm. Unfortunately, um, we in 2022, we said we needed to have an MOU right. that institutionalizes the study tour. Right. So it is only now that the MOU has been developed. Right. So in August, we shall have another study tour. We right. It, and the, we are taking 18 people. Right. We intend to include a few people, including probably somebody from the media. Okay. Uh, to also go on the tour. Right. Once we institutionalize it, and this time it's going to be a, a collaboration between the University of Cape Coast, Africa Center, um, of excellence for coastal right. resilience, mm. and then the Blue Economy and Governance Council. Consulting. That's going to organize it. Right. And then uh, probably we may get a few people from me, the media right. to now look at what happens in fisheries management mm. in the U.S. And, and Ghana. Right. I Last year, we went with the minister to China to mm. also look at what is it that they do in terms of their fisheries management right. that we are not doing right. Mm. So basically, these are some of the things... We've been doing behind the scenes right. to also get policy to appreciate beyond what we do here. Right. For instance, the experience of going to fishing and fishing mm. to understand how the fishing is undertaken, look, uh, discussing with their scientists, their right. uh, fisheries enforcement officers, and all of that, mm. um, brings to bear a lot of knowledge. Absolutely. Uh, the 2022 tour, for instance. We had an interaction with an assistant secretary of state. State, okay. In from the federal level. Yes. On and I recall you, you recently were in the port with another assistant yes, secretary, another of state. secretary of state. Yeah, yes, in, in Tema, yeah. And, right. And because mm, mm, also mm. the USAID is sponsoring uh, the pilot scheme for the electronic monitoring system right. in the trust sector. Mm. So 
there's been some effort to bring to bear international best practices in how we manage our fisheries. Yeah. And that is basically what this year's store would look at the blue economy, mm. post state measures, right. and of course the CI, uh, the C one eighty eight on the um, the uh, fishermen, basically focus on the rights of fishermen and how to. Do, but we we'll also look at the blue economy and then post state measures because post state measures are becoming one of the key things in dealing with issues of IEU. Uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so this one says, "Good evening, Iron Port. Great discussion. There is a need." for government to invest more into the fisheries sector because it employs a lot of Ghanaians. Ghanaians. This one is from Dan uh, in Nungwa. Is this something you agree with? Yes, certainly. You need to invest in the fisheries sector, but you need to invest more in the human capacity development mm. within the fisheries sector. Right. And we, we need to look at how to thin the industry, mm. how to get a lot more young people to have alternatives. Mm. Because the numbers in the industry... Do, are not sustainable. Right. And once they are not sustainable, uh, if you keep adding to the numbers, mm. the, then you have a lot more of illegality because then there is competition. Mm. It has to do with survival of the fittest. Right. So you need to thin the numbers so that at least you'll be able to manage the few numbers mm. that are in the industry. And right. they will be able to now feed the country because they will feed sustainably. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned the fact that you are uh, coming up with an MOU, which you want, yeah, the MOU which you is want already is institutionalized. Done. It's, the it's MOU been done. Is already done. Okay. Uh, I'm sure this may mm. um, is possible that the vice chancellor, the University of Cape Coast, and myself may go with okay. of the inside to, to um, because it's an addendum to, to an initial, existing okay. MOU between the University of Cape Coast and the University of Rhode Island. Okay. To enable us institutionalize the study top. Right. Okay. And because it's been useful so far. Absolutely. Okay. All right. But so, the tour itself will be in August. Mm. Uh, we have within the first 23 days in August to do the tour. We are already committed to the tour. Okay. And so we, we are in the process of writing to institutions we've identified okay. to nominate. And the participants will have to do full payment because okay. we don't have sponsorship for the tour. Right. Payment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rick Stanley. Ama Amafio is the Executive Director of the Blue Economy and Governance Consult. He is also the Vice President of National Fisheries Association of Ghana, uh, NAFAG, and he also does a lot of stuff, uh, like you said, for the tuna industry. Uh, he joined us in studio, and we also had Dr. Jemima Etonam Kasa, uh, as fisheries scientist, lecturer at the Department of Biology, uh, Education at the University of Education, Winneba, uh, joining us via Zoom. And uh, we remember, we've been taking a look at how to ensure best practices, uh, how to use best practices in ensuring uh, fisheries sustainability in our country, Ghana. Time is not our friend. If not, this conversation could have been, uh, you know, extended so we can elicit more from the man who has done so much for the fisheries sector, uh, Rick Stani and Ma and Matthew. We are hopeful that some other time we shall have it again to delve into some of these issues. We want to thank you so much for choosing our Paul tonight and we want to say a big thanks once again to our sponsors, Ghana Revenue Authority, Guel PLC, Serene Insurance, Ghana Link Network Services, Meridian Port Services and Phoenix Insurance. And we want to say a big thanks once again to our uh, you know, uh, media partner, the BNFT. And we want to say thank you to you also for choosing our Paul tonight and for sending in your messages and for calling in. I will say thank you to Nana from Dudowa. We entreat you to keep watching the rest of our programs here on Metro TV and we would also advise that on Wednesday, uh, make time and watch the abridged version on uh, GTV, uh, Ghana Television at 8.30 p.m. That's on Wednesday. Well, this is how we draw the curtain on tonight's edition of the program. God willing, next week we shall bounce back with another wonderful edition of High on Port. We wish you a super week ahead and have a blessed evening. Good evening. <laughs>